This is genius. This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to The Gritty Bowman. I've never seen so many mullets in my life. No, it's just about feeling good. You, you had more chins than a Chinese phone book for I a while. Man. Yeah, it, it was, was bad. bad. Yeah. I mean, he's right. he said, Goonies never say die. <laughs> We're going. We got this. All right. <laughs> I was pulling the trigger, but the safety was on. <laughs> I just Randy Black Not Eagle. Randy that's Black it. Eagle. Boom. That's that's my. That's how we roll. Just drop the <laughs> mic and walk away. New game, dude. These are like hyper aware, alert, mm -hmm. like supersonic superhero, super powerful yeah. mule deer. Yeah. Like they're not me normal no. mule deer, dude. Well, I don't know what they, they got survive. in their water, but these guys, yeah. these mule deer are on another level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh. No, That's it's what's nice, it's, though. It's like it, real guys hanging out. And, yeah, and, um, yeah, and it's just it's a good time from the time the five o'clock when the alarm goes off till eleven o'clock or twelve yeah. o'clock whenever you get to bed, and it's just it's like hanging out with your best friend the whole time. And, and dude, if you're hanging out with Aaron Snyder or Jeff Lander, you better have a thick skin. Yeah, you want to be on the offense. Real thick. You don't want to be defense. Yeah, I mean because. because you Crap's want to be prepared your to, way. Yeah, and you want to be prepared to hit like uh, I'm done with you on your cell phone because <laughs> that's, the, that's the Is it just that it's mule deer hunting? I mean, is that part or or is it just also that there's just giant mule deer? Well, I think it's a combination. For me, hunting here and guiding here is super exciting because um we do generally get action. Mm -hmm. every, every, most days you know get a, the opportunity to see those deer and, and to try your skills against that animal that's you know five six whatever years old that's you know so, some of these deer get hunted really hard so to put you know your skills against against that animal is is pretty it's pretty special and these guys with their with their recurves and and longbows and stuff that get into even closer. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a test. I think it tests your skills and, and you got to have a little bit of luck here and there too. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Bowman podcast. I am here with, uh, a man of many names. Um, I call you action Jackson, which I think is a good name. And, uh, Jeff Lander, owner of Primitive Outfitting. He calls you Ben Laden. Just when I'm hungry, he <laughs> says. As long as I'm eating, it's... Uh, yeah, and you are ben. ben Jackson. Yeah. And uh, Aaron and I, this podcast is coming to you from Alberta, Canada. I've never been here before. And we just came up here to hunt mule deer with Jeff Lander, yeah. which we met earlier in the year. Uh, when Aaron started shooting a recurve, Jeff has been a big primitive, you know, hence prim primitive outfitting, a, a, a primitive archery guy. A, a, you know, we had Jeff on the podcast um, before when we did our bear hunt in BC, mm -hmm. and Jeff hosted us there when Aaron shot his bear and I shot my bear, and it was uh, a really awesome experience. We hung out with Gary Hilsher and... Um, and if you if you're listening to this podcast or watching this podcast and you haven't seen that, go check it out because um, they're good stuff. And so I got number three almost ready to go. I was supposed to publish it before we left, but I um, I actually brought it with me. I thought so I could publish it while I was away, and I left my hard drive with all my stuff. So, um, but we'll get that out here asap. But yeah, we're here in Alberta, Canada, and hunting mule deer and i've never hunted mule deer before with a bow in open country uh well actually i did draw a tag once in oregon in southeast oregon when i hunted and i think i hunted three days and it was just like this yeah i mean open uh there's a li little bit of a learning curve here there's a huge learning curve yeah it's uh takes a few days to get used to how far we glass and and uh how so, hard it is to get close so ben you're your uh tell tell people who you are your background uh how you got involved in this uh who you know your relationship to jeff yeah well i guess i've been hunting since i was a kid or whatever and uh 
And how old are you um, now? I turned 41 in October. Nice. So, yeah, the old 40 club. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so been around hunting my whole life and stuff. And uh, I met Jeff a couple of years ago at CrossFit Gym mm-hmm. in, in uh, West Kelowna at Body Shop CrossFit. And uh, obviously saw the first light sticker in the... Um, truck? In the truck. and. <laughs> Um, what do you call that truck, by the way? I don't know. It's pretty... Uh, it's a pimped out black Toyota Tundra. Yeah, you definitely... It looks know. like somebody who's trying to overcompensate. Well, <laughs> or compensate truck, for something. so that's okay. We're going <laughs> to cut cut that truck some slack. Right? Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so I met Jeff a couple years ago. And, um, and yeah, uh, we've been doing some this mule deer thing. and Yeah. So, yeah, it's been you good. You helping I'm, Jeff guide. Um, well, this year was my kind of my first year full time. Mm-hmm. Um, I was out there spring uh, bear hunting with him and stuff, and and doing some doing some stuff. So hopefully there's more on the horizon. But uh, yeah, my normal life, I'm a helicopter mechanic, and and this is kind of my getaway time and do some guiding and meet some good people. And yeah, that's try. pretty cool. Uh, I um. Jeff's cool. He's Jeff's fun fantastic. to hang out yeah, with. Yeah, we we have such a good time. Like uh, it doesn't he's, matter. He's funny. He gives me are. crap every day. All I of give us. him crap. Yeah. Uh, no, that's what's an, nice it's, though. It's like it, real guys hanging out. And, yeah, and, um, yeah, and it's just it's a good time from the time the five o'clock when the alarm goes off till eleven o'clock or twelve yeah. o'clock whenever you get to bed, and it's just it's like hanging out with your best friend the whole time. And, and dude, if you're hanging out with Aaron Snyder or Jeff Lander. You better have a thick skin. Yeah, you want to be on the offense. Real thick. You don't want to be defense. Yeah, I mean, because, because yeah, you want to be prepared come your to, way. Yeah, and you want to be prepared to hit like I'm done with you on your cell phone because <laughs> that's, that's like Aaron's uh, new new favorite thing is. Yeah, he's on. You you guys are on the phone and Jeff was like, "You're Jeff, boring me. You're boring me." And then he'll hang up yeah. on you in the middle of. So a he only called me uh, <laughs> like 157 times today, but I bore him. So, <laughs> you know what's funny is. Um, I've been on, uh, so Jeff called me a few times because mm-hmm. when we got on Aaron's buck, so this podcast, we're going to cover uh, kind of my story, mm-hmm. hunt, hunting my deer, and then uh, we're going to do another one with Jeff and uh, Aaron and I uh, covering uh, Aaron's monster buck. Mm-hmm. There's some great, it's a great story. So yeah. excited to kind of share that with people and get them excited. Yeah. Well, about, both hunts were super fun and, and unique too, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, here on the last day of the hunt, which is today, mm-hmm. um, we we got on. We all kind of spread out. Yeah, we put our resources all over the place yep. today and got after it. I when I was talking to Jeff, though, I've been on the phone with him a couple oh, times, sorry, and he's yeah. like, "Hey, Brian, what do you got? You got a couple of bucks, you know, bedded?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I got a couple of be- bucks. You should come over here to this area. You know, I know where they're at, and put on a stock." And he's like, "Click." <laughs> There's no like, yeah. thanks or okay, I'm yeah, on my no. way. It's just, he just hangs up that's or he'll right. be like, I, so how many are there? Where are they at? And there's four and they're on the hill. Well, that's, Click. That's because <laughs> he's like, okay, he's got his information. <laughs> that's because Jeff doesn't want, he wants his hunter to think that Jeff drove up on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the game. Yeah. So anyway, uh, um, it's a little late. Yeah, it is late. It's uh, yeah, but that's all right. And we've been going without sleep for days, so we're a little mm. bit uh, yeah. We could use groggy, coffee maybe, but so you got involved with Jeff and you came down here and started um, guiding. So tell me, um, what do you like the most about it? Um, well, I I love meeting new people and I love the archery part. I love talking about like bow setups and different things every day, and and it and it's fun to find the animals and try to. Th- the, the stocks are everyone's different mm-hmm. and everyone has its challenges and and i think you learn every time the more you yeah. do it and it's neat to see people from their first day you know like monday morning um you, you maybe hopefully get on a stock unfortunately for you and i it wasn't until tuesday morning with all the fog and stuff on the first day but um yeah you learn a lot like you said tonight we're driving home on saturday night and uh you're like yeah that first stock was was uh I wish I would have done it. Well, no, it's not a disaster. I think we just learn, right? I, I, you know, but, but it's fun. It's, it's almost better. Um, 
those first ones to for a guy to make a mistake and, and then he understands how hard it is because if you do it every time and he follows you then then it's kind of i don't think he really appreciate how because you know it doesn't matter how good it go, how good you do you, you could blow out and in, in yeah two minutes and it could be over and and and, and that's going to happen. So. Well, Aaron has hunted a lot of mule deer across the West, uh, and especially in Colorado, bow hunted a lot of mule deer. And one thing we were noticing that he's mentioned, he's hunted a lot in, uh, he's hunted in Nevada as well, in mm-hmm. desert country, open country, a lot like this. And uh, one of the things he, he mentioned, you know, we both noticed, my impression of some of, of some mule deer, you know, is, is, you know, they'll see a movement or they'll see something that they kind of hang tight a little bit. They give you a few seconds. They're not sure what to do. Yeah. They might watch you for a while. Well, they're occasionally kind of dumb in some yeah. parts of the world. Yeah. Country for sure. Like unhunted. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the urban ones. We come here. Yeah. <laughs> New game. Dude. These are like hyper aware alert mm-hmm. like supersonic superhero super powerful yeah. mule deer yeah like they're not me- normal no. mule deer dude no, i don't know what they, they got survive. in the water but these guys yeah. these mule deer are on another level mm-hmm. even the does like um yeah you you know that one doe can rack your stock mm-hmm. and uh the first day we got on to to some <laughs> yeah. pigs, these two yeah. monster bucks and I saw those two deer. I was like, and, and there were 12 does with them. Mm-hmm. Well, they ended up bedding up on top. Yeah. And those were the ones we got some great footage of, right? We did. We and, got some um, video of those and they were like sentinels. Like there was like, mm-hmm. there was, there was no way to, uh, to approach them where they were sitting. They were impossible to stock with a bow. And, um, so you're looking at that and like, Anyway, they go down into the canyon. It's like, okay, well, now we can hunt, sneak up to the lip of the draw or something. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really new to this, so I don't really know what to do. And we sneak over to the edge and peek down, and uh, it didn't take me long to blow it. Um, Buck just heard some noise. Uh, my, my boots were squeaking just a little bit, like mm-hmm. le- leather. They were like... Rrr, rrr. And then the boots, the, you know, just because they're not soft soled or yeah. anything, the ground just crunch. Yeah, no, it was crunchy. Crunch. That day for sure. And so it's every move I made was just loud. And uh, it was, so I'm trying to do this sneak and no idea really where the deer were, what the canyon might look like. You know, saw it from a distance, but not up close and hadn't been down inside of it. And, and so we get over there and, I got blown out right away. I mean, we were two minutes into the stock, it seemed like, and, and the yeah. deer were gone. Yeah. Um, and you got to watch those giant deer just bounce away. Yeah. And plus the whole canyon. like Yeah, we they took out, I think, about 24. Yeah, right? one one little deer didn't like what it saw. The one thing we didn't take out was Aaron Snyder, though, because <laughs> uh, he was standing at the top of the coulee. Aaron was uh, doing his own stock um, on a buck, apparently, that was uh, downwind of us. <laughs> Very downwind. So um, he's approaching the ledge, and by the time he, he looks to the side and he sees where we're standing, and he's like, yeah. he threw a mini temper tantrum on the hill a little bit because um, we blew it because he had like a 15-yard shot over the lip on a nice buck. But I bet he's happy now. Oh yeah, yeah. I made up for that with yeah. the with that one. Yeah. Um, with his with his deer. So, uh, yeah. So what I noticed about this hunt was that the the mule deer, the big mule deer, uh, all the mule deer, they they all could spot you on a. I mean, any if your head's poking up too high on a if you're skylined at all, they're out. Yeah. Um, they're they you're a thousand i i i ranged it mm-hmm. you know at 800 to a thousand yards away when the phone rings yeah yeah i got in crap for that too they just jerk their head up all of them like all 14 it's not like one of them hears no. a faint sound 14 of them turn yeah, like and hear your voice yeah 
It's crazy. Yeah, but it's so fun. We're sitting there. I'm like, surely they didn't hear that. There's no way they could hear that, but they do. Yeah. Well, that's a whole. They recognize. They hear. They must hear voices. Somehow must carry. I don't know, but yeah. No, they're super alert to like you said all those things, whether it's movement or voice or you know, and obviously the wind is just the number one. I did thing. find that the wind here, because of all the coolies and then the, all the flat country, mm-hmm. this is probably one of the easiest places I've ever hunted when it comes to the wind. Yeah, no, I mean it's generally pretty, pretty consistent. It, it, and- it really like in in some of the places where I'm at, I mean. It, there's no prevailing wind. Half the time it goes one way and then it goes the next way. Here, I felt like there were some mysteries, like yeah. those two bucks. On the day I shot my buck, mm-hmm. and we'll get into that, there were two great bucks that we bedded, monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was going to go shoot one of those two. I was pretty stacked, stoked about it, because it was like really yeah. my first like stock now that I... You know, Got a few other than the one I totally screwed up. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, this is it. And then we, I got around. We knew the wind was tough. Um, and they weren't in a great spot, those two bucks. But they were, they were in a smart yeah. location. No, they were the the odds were in their favor. Sure. Um, I still wonder. I still wonder had yeah. I done it, things this or that, you know. And sure. it, again, it was just another way to another experience Mm -hmm. right like um but the wind has been a lot easier here and today was awesome like in any i think you can just see that in um when it's consistent like that we we can get we can definitely get close you know yep for sure it helps too when it's a heavy uh, yeah a heavy wind absolutely right because then it stays really forceful one direction your your scent doesn't get you know kind of off on the wind and then maybe catch a thermal and blow mm-hmm. down Canyon That's or right. it sucked someplace. It just kind of gushes yeah. right off the top. Mm-hmm. And mostly what the country we were, we're hunting is pretty much like flat landscape yep. with these cuts and these little canyons, little coolies mm-hmm. that are just, you know, you're looking at this, vast flat area and then you'll just see like a cut in the ground and those little canyons are where all the deer go in bed in the afternoon yeah so they feed in the they feed in the alfalfa or the pea fields or just in the meadows and then as soon as the sun starts coming up and it starts to warm up they all migrate off of the feeding areas Mm -hmm. where they've been all night and they dump into those those draws those coolies Mm -hmm. And uh, our goal is, you know, when they come off of those and you're watching them, you want to see where they go down in the coulee. And I wasn't sure on day one, I was like, yeah, but just because they went off right there doesn't mean that's where they're at. Because you, you completely lose sight yeah, of them. Yeah, they're gone, yeah. It's not like, uh, you know, when you're hunting high country mule deer, you see a guy, you know, glass that buck in the morning and he watches it walk down the hill the whole way down the hillside and go you know you you can watch that thing travel from a feed area to a bedding area it never gets out of sight really Mm um here it can go down into a canyon yeah and you're up on top a thousand meters from the lip of that thing and as soon as it goes into that black hole there's just a maze of yeah. coolies. Like they totally can go straight, world. they can cut left, right. They can circle. They can, there's just a maze of these, these fingers everywhere. Mm-hmm. But, but if they go in over here, they could walk 2000 yards they down. Would no you would idea. never know. Yeah. And you can't get, you know, if you walk to the edge of the coolie and try to track them as they walk through it, they, uh, they'll see you unless yeah. you're belly crawling. Yeah, and, the, and then they, and then the, a lot of times they'll rebed. You know, they'll bed mm-hmm. it. They'll bed at, you know, seven thirty, eight o'clock, and then get, get up, up again at nine or ten or whatever, and move. And then uh, a lot of times that's why we wait till eleven, yeah, ish to kind of go after them. I was really surprised by how much movement we were getting um, on these el- on these deer after they for that second bed mm-hmm. 
you know, sometimes they'll get up and when they rebed, they bed quite a distance away. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's important that you don't go after them as soon as you see them disappear. You kind of need to just hang back and, and, uh, that's an experience I'll, sh I'll talk about on uh, the next podcast with Aaron. Cause that's kind of how we got on his buck and he killed his buck. Right. But the other thing that surprised me though, was most of the time when they go off the lip and in to a coulee, they're there. That's yeah. right where they, they don't go very far. Once they go into the coulee, they just stop right there. Mm -hmm. That was what I saw uh, nine out of 10 times. As soon as the buck, you know, went down in the coulee there, at least in the areas where we were at. I think that's pretty common, you know, I mean, especially for that first bed, like you say, they just seem like they want to get off the, off the field and into cover and, and they're happy with that and then move again. Yeah. But, uh, the other thing that I noticed was they seem to always bed on a steep, steep cliff at their back. Yeah. They really, yeah, the big bucks, like that, for the sure, the really big bucks, mature yeah. ones, they seem to get right on that back at a, edge of a cliff mm -hmm. so they can see everything coming from below yeah. approaching them. Yeah, wind at their back. And the wind at their back coming off the top, mm -hmm. which brings me to this next point. So you and I, we're driving down the road. Um, this is day four, maybe, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, we're we're driving down. Uh oh, Lander has infiltrated my apartment in his underwear. He's going into Aaron's room, and Aaron's asleep. So, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to poke that bear. No. <laughs> All right. So we're sitting there. Uh, we're driving to a spot, and we actually spot a buck that looks pretty heavy horned, big body too. Like. Yeah, that's one thing I'll say about these Alberta mule deer. They're giant. They have giant bodies, mm -hmm. just huge, huge bodies. So anyway, uh, we we get the camera on him actually, and we film him, and he goes into this little coulee. And uh, so we're like, okay, that's a pretty good buck, you know. Definitely an older buck, and one we might hunt. Yeah. And we drive down the road a little further, and and then we park. And we get out and we glass this huge wide open expanse. Yeah. Right. It's big. And we're glassing it and we get up to the top of this little knob. And uh, you're like, here, go, you know, rather than us just both glass this, you know, why don't you climb up onto that little knob and see what's on the other side? Because there's a whole bunch of area there too. So I went over there and I spotted two great. Big yeah. They bucks. were nice, nice deer. And I was like, I mean, what are they like? One sixty, one seventy. Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to tell, but I mean, I would, yeah. I would say conservative. They were one sixty. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I would plus. Say. I was like one eighty. Yeah, <laughs> one of them was really yeah. nice. Yeah, they're they're pretty nice. I mean, I like to say it's hard to score them right there, yeah. but they're they're beautiful. Big bodies. I mean, I'm just looking at these deer, and they have, I don't know how big Aaron's is. The deer, my buck, same thing. Just huge bodies mm -hmm. and they can take an arrow they eat <laughs> arrows i mean it, it's like shooting an elk yeah pretty much i think it, i think it's you know similar and uh i'm just not used to this kind of mule deer on steroids mm -hmm. and when we skinned them out and everything these things are just uh covered in fat and layers of of uh of th hide that's just on another level so, uh, anyway, I see these bucks and I'm, I'm like, okay, well, right away, I'm pretty optimistic. But but, I think we both were pretty optimistic. Yeah. We and were, we were and they looked like we they were, were right at the lip of this little drop and then they were right there and totally shootable, stockable. Um, but we did know the wind was kind of against us a little bit. Anyway. Um, so I go over there, you get some gear together. Um, and in order to get to the, that buck, we, we kind of have to be careful. And this is the challenge with mostly everywhere we went, deer, deer are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I learned a hard lesson on day one when we scared like 40 deer out of that canyon. <laughs> 
<laughs> one deer causes this massive domino effect. One deer runs, this whole canyon erupts, and deer just... And your morning's over. It's over. The whole canyon's yeah. empty. It's like if they, they just... That's the other thing is I've seen lots of deer spook, and some stay put and some don't. Here, as a rule, they seem to just leave the mm -hmm. whole lot of them. They're like, yeah. we're done. So they come across like deer that are heavily hunted, <laughs> like very experienced. They're very experienced. And I don't know if that necessarily comes from a lo like a lot of the rifle season or um, mm -hmm. or what, but they're- Because we're in Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. So- um, Archery only in the in these zones uh, till October 31st. And then there's a draw um, rifle season. Uh, we, we saw that buck earlier as we were driving by. The smaller one, you know, than the other two, but a great buck, go down into this little coulee. So, uh, along with what we thought was a doe at the mm -hmm. time, a little little doe. So we, I cruise over there and we glass up that little coulee to try to systematically, you kind of systematically check each thing along your way, paying attention to where the wind is, so that your wind never blows into something that you haven't inspected first. Yeah. So you kind but of have to glass and do the best you can searching these coolies with the wind in your favor which consists of a lot of crawling on your yeah. stomach to the lip of a draw a, through the cactus yeah through the cactus which this place has prickly pear cactus and all kinds of other stuff yeah. that's just nasty and uh I've, my elbows knees and hands are just riddled with needles and they're just sore and raw <laughs> i mean next time i come i'm bringing elbow pads yeah. Of some kind of soft, you know, like hard but soft outer layer and some... Maybe we can talk to Kenton and Scott. Of, uh, Seriously, first light, cactus. hook me up. Uh, knee pads. Anti-cactus. Anti-cactus gear. But that stock, like, um, you know, even on just after a couple of days, like you found that, that buck almost right away. Yeah. And that's what it took too, though, is it took being a lot more cautious yeah slow for sure being very slow being very patient and work and you can hear jeff yapping at you in the yeah. Oh, yeah. back of your head <laughs> all the time Just yeah go slow and i when i'm crawling to the edge you know it's like you just you just have to do it mm -hmm. take your time do it if you walk up to the edge there's just something about it that they can see when you crawl to the edge, especially the lower you get, I found, and you mentioned this yeah. to me earlier in the week, when the grass is up here, you know, about a foot tall, and you're crawling, and you stay in that foot of grass, mm -hmm. and you're just barely glassing kind of even through the grass as you get to the lip, they just don't see that. I mean, no, repeatedly over and over and over again, that, that was like a safe way to approach that ledge without getting seen. Now, when I was up on my hands and knees, that was not low enough. It was yeah. still too high. Um, very hard to... So, just as a general rule, I'm trying to keep my binoculars, you know, right at the level of the grass or where I'm looking through grass to be able to see. And you're just looking for antler tips, mm -hmm. you know, just something, just a piece of a body. So, we do that and sh we find the buck I actually kill, um, we find him in there. And um, he looks pretty good yeah and we actually talk about whether i should go just for it, it just get it over with just shoot but it. we we come up with that was plan b the thing was is we knew where the other two were and they were giant and yeah. i was like it wasn't hard to talk you out of plan b to go to yeah a. i was like let's go we talked about blowing blowing this one and then going for the other one like trying it and mm -hmm. but then we were like that's a you know you're like or the other way around like let's go for the big ones and they were also uh, not likely to spook this one. It was in a deep yeah, cut. Yeah, no, they, that was the way to go for sure. So we go after uh, the two big ones, and we get in there, and that does not go well. <laughs> I mean, he got to 80 yards. -ish. Oh, dude, if I could redo that. Uh, and that's how hunting is. Yeah. It's like, if I could redo it. Because yeah. there's, there's things over. I would do differently. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I would have done is worked out hand signals. Before we got started, yeah, we were off. We weren't on. The we're kind of just in a hurry, right? Yeah. And and uh, you're over there glassing, and you have them seen. And 
we didn't really work out any kind of like, this is how we're going to work this out, which was, you know, I should have done it. I just hadn't thought about it. You know, I was, I don't know. It looked very stockable till you get to that side. It was almost a slam dunk that way. Yeah. The only thing I had to worry about flat out was just some wind behind me, you know, that was blowing toward the deer, but you're up on these flats where the wind is just gushing hard and these deer are down in these little coolies deep down. And the question, you know, I found this many times where the wind didn't actually go down and where they could, it blew over their heads Mm -hmm. or, you know, I'm not sure what it did after it blew past the lip, but it didn't actually take to the, to the deer. So I saw that happen a few times. One thing that Aaron has is he's got these little um, thermal. Yeah, you were telling me about that. I've never seen those before. And they come in a little box. And it's just like one of those, uh, you know, like a weed, uh, what do you call it? Those little cotton type, what do you call those things? Whisper type? When you blow those flowers and they like. Oh, like a dandelion. Dandelions are yellow, aren't they? But when dandelions die, that's when you get the oh, white really? poofies. I did not know that. Okay. There you go. So that's a dandelion too? Yeah. Yeah, when the, green, when the yellow dandelion dies, turns white. And you blow on it and mm-hmm. it just poof. Mm-hmm. Got it. So you get more dandelions. <laughs> Less in <laughs> the birds and the bees. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, uh, so the dandelion blows off and... Um, that's that little thing that floats away. Aaron has like a box of those. And so he would drop them. We were elk hunting. He's like, they're kind of expensive. So, but you can reuse them if you can catch it. But, but he would drop it and it would blow. And your set checker, we had that too, your little powder. And he'd blow that and it'd blow in the air and it would blow downhill. But then it would dissolve. But this little scent checker he's got, it's floating through the wind. That's cool. And it just keeps going and keep going, keep going. And then when it hits the lip, it might shoot up and then go way far away. Or it hit the lip and it'll suck down and it'll cut left right. and blow right and, to where the deer are. And you know what I noticed um, today and yesterday, actually, after you told me about those little wind checker things, mm-hmm. is that maybe you know the answer to this or we might have to ask Cal. Mm-hmm. But um, you can see almost like uh, like spider web strings in mm-hmm. the air right now and i don't know what those come yep, from i saw but i was too. watching those today and yesterday uh with the kind of the thermals and it's certainly in the bigger bowls um you know you can see it moving but i think that in the the really steep coolies then the air is you know blown over top and not such a big deal yep so those two deer that we first stalked uh we're definitely in like more of a bowl type thing and we had some Big open coolie kind it, of stuff. Yep. And then the other one, um, the what the deer that he killed was definitely in a way deeper. one of the most narrow coolies we yeah. hunted. And they're su- certainly I mean, a, little it's bit, a slot, a little bit uh, harder to shoot, but easier to stalk probably. Yep. Uh, first of all, the straight up. I mean, he has to crane his neck to look up. It's so steep. Yeah. You know, and then. And then, like you said, it's just such a narrow little slot that when the wind's blowing hard, it doesn't seem to suck into the mm-hmm. canyon. It just blows over the top. I don't know the science behind yeah. it, but that's, I agree. I saw the same thing. Um, one of the things, like Aaron said, uh, when they're goat or sheep hunting, uh, you know, they're, they're especially, when you see a sheep in a certain spot and you want to stalk it, you can check the wind, but when you're on those mountaintops, it's hard to see what the thermals are doing. Yeah. And certain areas, the wind's gusting up, sometimes it's gusting down and across or whatever. Well, when you drop one of those little deals, you can kind of see the wind pattern in a little channel or a little goalie and kind of yeah. see what's going. And then you can formulate. And do we? he was watching this little thing float with his binoculars for a long way. And uh, drop two or three of those, and the same thing happens. And you're like, "What a powerful no, tool!" Yeah, that's a right. That's I mean, we'll it kind of got some of those. Kind of gives you that 
that visual. I don't know what they're called. People are probably going to ask, and I'll have to put it like in the show notes. But I hadn't heard of them or seen them before, and Aaron whips them out. He's a man of many, many skills. Yeah, he's got <laughs> some goodies. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, we go for those two bucks, and everything is very stockable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great sh – I mean, it's a 30-yard shot, maybe. Um, it's it's not – it's steep, but it's it's doable. The um, the bucks are both looking downhill. Uh, it's 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 good. You're, you're, you're over there. You can tell me to go left or right. You've got some hand signals down. Um, the problem we run into is the wind is blowing at my back. And I don't know if once the wind hits the coulee – if it's going down the coulee mm -hmm. or up the coulee. And I, I would have I would have had to lie to you. I didn't know either. And so uh, I got back to the hotel and I said, hey, Lander, generally, you know, what happens? Because I'm used to hunting, you know, the west and the mountains and where, you know, your wind is, is generally blowing, you know, like downhill in the morning mm -hmm. and in the evening and then it's blown uphill in the afternoon yep. you know a lot of elk they'll try to hit the mountain they'll try to they'll feed in those meadows because it's blowing downwind all night long and all evening um they'll feed all night in that safe place and then they'll try to get out of that meadow and back to back up high on the mountain or into their bedding area and move while the wind is still going downhill and it's still blowing in their face. Mm -hmm. So as they travel up to their area, they, they have the wind in their favor. And then by the time they get there, the winds will switch and start blowing uphill. Right. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, a trick when you're hunting elk, you know, you, you got to manage that wind because you can't get in front of them, intercept them on their way to their bedding area because they got you by the, by the wind you can't follow them from behind because by the time they get the winds going kind of back and forth by the time they get to their bedding area it's blowing at your back and so it's a uh, it's a challenge right so i'm kind of going off of that as i approach the coulee and i'm like okay well the wind is it's it's afternoon you know i i don't know i think it's it must be blowing up the coulee you know um as the wind blows across the top, hits the coulee, you know, it's got to go, once it goes into the coulee, it's kind of got to go up or down it. There's just some thermals in there. Lander's like, yeah, it kind of blows down 24 <laughs> seven. Yeah. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, pretty much as a general rule, once it hits the coulee, it goes down the coulee. I'm like, really? And so it doesn't really change throughout the day. Oh. Um, and I didn't have where I hunted, um, a couple of times and where Aaron shot his buck on the top when was the same every, all day long, 24 seven. That was how it was today. Yeah. It's so a little easier when I got onto Aaron, uh, or when I got onto that buck and anyway, the wind, uh, came through and at my back and, it, and I, I should have, so I'm not far from the, from the deer. And, um, I, again, I'm trying to decide which side to approach them from as I'm coming from the back. It could have been doomed either way. I don't know. Yeah. They're kind of in this little amphitheater and I'm like, if the wind's blowing that way and it's just getting sucked into the center, either way, they winded me right off. I mean, it didn't take them long. And, uh, I, I mean, maybe it was just not approachable. Maybe the wind just was never going to cooperate. Um, but that's kind of how a lot of these hunts work out. I think when, when I'm hunting elk, right. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm not quite, you know, down, downwind of the elk, you know, but I'm close, you know, I'm often like at an angle, right. Just so close that they could almost smell me, but my wind's just blowing just a little bit off. And, and it's during that, you know, they feel pretty safe because the wind is in their face, but you're just off from them such in such a way that they can't quite catch your wind because it's blowing down a little bit off. And it's, it's a game of inches, you know, yeah, when you get in there to that yeah. range. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, if I had cheated one side or the other, 
if I had known a little more about the coolies and stuff, then those game of inches could have paid off, you know. But you never know, could have uh, been doomed from the start. Either way, when they when you told me, um, you know, they're leaving, uh, I hustle around and I'm looking at you, I'm looking at the box and I'm like, and they're standing there, they have no idea where I'm at, but they're looking around on the edge about 100 yards away going, we smell you. It's the smelly guy. Where are you? And they're looking and they're looking. They look for quite a while, like a minute, minute and a half. And uh, it's just too far for me. I can't shoot that far. And um, they ran away and crushed my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't long. No, right after that, it was like I was trying to, you know, learn from the experience. We talked about it a little bit. And then, then it was time to get after the other buck. And it's funny because what what did we say? What did I say? What, what what was our attitude at that point? Never quit. Never quit. What else? Because one of the things was like I was I was saying, uh, you know, going after this new buck. I was like, after seeing these one eighty bucks, oh, yeah. and then I see this buck, and I'm literally I'm I'm hunting in an area where I've never. I, you know, the class of animal here, the class of buck is on another scale. Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen more 180, 190 bucks this week than I've ever seen on mm -hmm. any hunt. It's pretty impressive. And it I mean, it this really is, is. This is a great year. And yeah, so I'm kind of balancing this whole thing. It's like, I've never shot a mule deer with a bow. So, um, I'm just thrilled with anything. Mm -hmm. Just the, I just want to experience a stock and a hunt and the whole just have an experience i want to hunt a mature deer i don't want to hunt a baby that's retarded or, yeah you know i want the challenge i want to have the experience but at the same time there's not very many opportunities well there's that, difference um excuse me between seeing them and getting to to bow range you on, mentioned that actually some of these deer so you mentioned that we were talking in the truck one day and you were like um, there are a lot of guys who passed, you know, that that'll come on a hunt. And I think it's pretty common for guys. Jeff has talked about it before where I was like, nah, it's not big enough. It's not big enough. And, and a lot of times what, what they'll say is, yeah, I passed on, uh, on two, you know, or five, one sixty five 165 bucks. Yeah. Well, passed on is, did you really, so it's kind of like, uh, to me, if you say I passed on it, means you could have shot it. Yeah, not passed by it when you were driving. Not decided. In the pickup truck. Yeah, or passed, passed by it. That's when that's the Rudy Bowman lingo here. That's right. If you pass on it, it means you could have drew, drew on it. Yeah, you could have drawn on it and killed it. I mean, it was like, and you decided not to. Yeah, which is fine. Um, uh, what do you call it if a guy is just like, yeah, that's not big enough. Because you use the same term, right? People are like, oh, you passed on it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like saying I could have shot it with a rifle, maybe. <laughs> you know? Maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. Right, right. Well, at the end of the day, um, I'm, I'm sitting there going, well, there's still a few days left. And in a special place like this, I could really, really chase a giant mule deer. Uh but at the same time, here is a buck that I found on my own. That's right. That I I know where he's at. Um, I belly crawled, you know. I feel like a sense of accomplishment, yeah, right? I got him deer. bedded. Um, I um, I was like, I had in my mind how I could perform the stock and how it would work, and and all of that, all those pieces coming together, and it's sort of like this opportunity where. To, to do what I really wanted to try. Yeah, and you did, and all I did was come up and turn the camera on. It was perfect, <laughs> actually. It was pretty awesome. I, yeah. So we come around, and, and we, we come up, and, and actually, you, you hung behind, and you, you ran the camera while I went and checked the lip of the, the, the coulee mm -hmm. where we last saw him. And we kind of marked, we're on the, uh, the other, we're, we're, when we glassed him the first time, we were on the opposite side right. of the coulee from where if I were to shoot him, I'd have to shoot across the coulee to the other side of it, mm -hmm. which would be doable. It's 
it was a narrow cold coolie. Sure. But but we wanted to get right above him. Um so he wouldn't see me um, and shoot straight down. So we we started looking. I'm I'm walking to the edge and I'm I'm crawling to the edge and looking. And I'm like no deer. So I go up a little further. No deer. And all all the while, of course, paying attention to the wind and uh, no deer, no deer. And then finally, I see this deer and I come back and I'm talking to you. I'm like, I'm, I think I gave you some hand signals. I'm not sure, but I I came over. And I'm like. I don't know either. So we saw a buck and a doe. Yeah, we thought that's. But it was dark, so yeah. you can barely see. Even the buck I shoot, you could barely see his antlers at the in the dark. And I'm like, I don't think that's. So I said, he just is a lot smaller. <laughs> He's like a forked horn. I thought he was bigger, you know. And and I'm like, that can't be him. That can't be him. There must be three deer down there. Well, then later I would put together that that wasn't really a doe. That was a forked horn buck. Mm -hmm. uh, just couldn't see in the dark. Uh, couldn't see his antlers. Um, and uh, so I go back to the drawing board and search the whole lip again, trying to find this buck. And uh, he ended up being bedded on the slope right below me. He was super tight on that bank. But it was like I just barely saw antler tips. And you, you could see from the camera how difficult he is to spot. Mm -hmm. Once you see him, you're like, oh, there he is, you know, but, but he was hard to see. In fact, uh, <laughs> I'm like, come on down. You come, cause I was down there glassing him for a while, getting things set up. And I'm like, I waved to you to come on down. And when you came on down, you lean over and you're like, you ranged it and you're like, oh yeah, 35 yards, smoke him. And, uh, it was a little buck and I'm like, no, 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 he's 20 yards. <laughs> yeah, the one I want is 20 yards. I didn't even see it when I walk, walked over it uh, or crawled over, I guess. And uh, so you took a look at him and and you're like, that's a good deer. Yeah. Real good deer. Absolutely. So um, I really, I, 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 I fell in love with him the second I saw him. And so, uh, but it's so steep. And so we went through a series of options there. The wind seemed solid. Yeah, the wind was perfect. Yeah. And he's down in that steep cut. So um, we get to the edge. We're right there. And the thing is, is it's so steep. We're kind of laying sideways on the hill almost. And there's like a little, like, we're kind of already over the lip, down the hill a little bit. And there's like a little ledge kind of on that little ledge and uh you know you lean over just a tiny bit and you feel so exposed yeah you know um but we get the camera set up get it trained on uh the buck and i'm gonna film it the shot with the camera when the buck stands up i'm gonna shoot it i actually was like really i didn't want to wait for it to stand up at all <laughs> yeah and, and we had I'm a discussion like, about that. Yeah, though. we did. And I'm like, I'm like, Ben, I'm just going to shoot it in its bed. I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. I wanted it would have been super cool. Badass. Yeah. <laughs> I really, there was no angle or shot. I mean, no. he's buried in there. And I'm like, but Ben, if I go up here, I could maybe shoot. Or if I go here and you're like, just sit where you're at and wait for him to stand up. And... um that was really hard for me. <laughs> yeah. And we sat there for quite a while too. How long were we there? I think it was, it was probably close to an hour. I would think that the little buck got like up it. and fed. Did he feed twice? Twice. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a bit of time to hold on the check cord. On well, you. and you're like cockeyed on the hill and I got my boat ready and I'm, I'm on my knees, my legs falling asleep, and but you need to be in position to be able to draw and then lean over. The, the problem is I wanted to draw the bow, you know, where the, he couldn't see the movement. Right. And then I wanted to lean over at full draw. So I was already, so the movement that he does see is just me inching over, which may not catch his attention the way drawing a bow would, especially because this bow is like 80 some pounds, um, which I'd never shot an 80 pound bow before this year. And Aaron, when we were working with Hoyt and 
ordering up the bows. Aaron's like, yeah, do 80, do 80. I did 80 for years, do 80, you'll be fine. And I'm like, well, I do 70 now. I really like 70, but uh, I'll try it. I'll do 80, uh, you know. So I do it. 70 is doable. 80 for me, and and I'm sure if I practice and practice and practice and got stronger or whatever, uh, but still at the end of the day, 80 is a heavy pull. Mm Mm-hmm. Just it never go, it never stops being heavy, and uh, I've noticed this year that like at some archery tournaments and some shoots and stuff that after shooting all day long at like total archery challenge, I'm starting to experience fatigue. You know, even if I shoot my bow a lot, mm-hmm. just because eighty pounds is heavy, and I think it's eighty three or eighty something. Uh, it's it's maxed out. That's a it's a lot to pull. So it proved to be a little bit of a problem (laughs) when I was, uh, keep in mind, we've slept like, I don't know, five hours a night. I have a couple, a couple nights in a row. And then, uh, and then we, uh, a little dehydrated, tired, the whole bit. Right. And, and then you throw on top of that in a cockeyed position, your legs asleep, you know, you've been leaning over and and now you got to draw your bow. I have to draw my bow kind of angled sideways. My abs are engaged, you know, everything's, and I want to keep my, my eyes on the buck looking over the hill while I also pull 80 pounds. And, uh, so sure enough, that buck stands up and I go to draw that bow back, and and cool thing was, my the camera died. The, in fact, I posted a picture of it on Instagram. Yeah, you know, here I am. I'm right comments. here. There's a buck right there, and um, all the camera dudes like uh, um, they're like, better switch that battery. Better switch that battery. Well, I didn't have another battery, and I'm sitting there. And I'm trying to conserve it, and and you never know when he might stand up. Anyway, it dies about a minute and a half, two minutes before that buck stands up, which is frustrating. So, um, buck stands up, and there's no battery in the camera, and I have my iPhone going on the side to film at least something of me taking the mm-hmm. shot, and it's on a little tripod, and it blows over. <laughs> so, Action Jackson to the rescue... Ben, you grab the uh, the iPhone and flip that sucker up and film me, and you film me try to draw that eighty pounds the first time, which yeah. nobody knows about this because I haven't, I didn't share, I didn't show that. Oh, you yet. didn't show that part yet. And uh, I just posted the actual shot on uh, Instagram, but I go to pull that thing back, and I got it about pff, I don't know four inches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm like. This ain't happening. Yeah. This angle where I'm at, my shoulder the way it is, trying to peek over the side. I'm. This is not coming. This is this is too heavy. And as I pulled back, the the rest that contains the arrow made a clicking sound, and that buck just he stand he's standing there and he's pretty chill. Mm-hmm. But as soon as he heard that sound, he then jerked he pinned, his head up and he's looking sure. straight up at me. So now. I'm thinking after all of this work and after all of this to have him bounce away because of a rookie, like just this, this mistake would just be so frustrating. But uh, then I'm like, you know, you just do what you can. Right. So don't give up. So you pulled harder. Yeah. Team never quit. (laughs) So I just sat there and I was like, uh, I waited quite a bit. Uh, hoping he would calm down. I didn't even look over the edge. I just leaned back over him. It was killing me because I'm like, what if he's walking away? What if he's doing this? What if he's, but just instinct, you know, you kind of know their their attitude. And I'm like, he's looking right up that hill and he's waiting to see what he's going to see. So I wait like a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. And then I lean over and he's just feeding on grass and stuff. And so I'm like, okay, so 
Now, there's a bunch of brush in the way. I can't, there's no clear shot, so I'm sitting there. You can't see the deer, can you? Well, no, I didn't want to peek my head over at that point. We don't need more, uh, <laughs> what, did, what does Jeff call it? The uh, bobbleheads or the uh, <laughs> peekaboos or whatever. Yeah. yeah no, I, I was just leading back and yeah, playing it smart. You do, letting you do your thing. So you got the camera going, which I was really grateful for. I was glad you did that. And I lean over that hill. So anyway, I get the bow. I get leaned over sideways and this time I'm like looking down, but I'm like, okay, I got to focus on pulling the bow back. So I pulled it back, which everybody can see on Instagram. And, uh, and yes, it was a, uh, people were like, your eyes are bulging out of your head. (laughs) Everyone's an expert. though. (laughs) I'll tell you this though, that trying to pull it back slowly and quietly is a lot different than just pulling it back. Right. You know, and uh, whether I'm pulling really heavy, you know, or, or lighter, I pretty much am, you know, pulling with a lot of the same, that same slow concentration, you know. But as I get that bow back, um, it's an awkward position, sloped on the hill, leaning sideways. I got one leg lower than the other. I'm on my knees now. Been kind of sitting sideways on my butt and knees. But I look over my left shoulder while I got the bow at full draw to make sure, you know, so I get it. I can finally, he looks away, looks downhill. So I lean the bow over him. I don't know how long I held it at full draw. Quite a while. I mean, I don't, I didn't count the seconds on the, yeah, film, but it's, it's a while. And as I, and I know, over, I was even before that, I was sit, <laughs> sitting there looking at you going like, holy. That's a good job because a lot, <laughs> lot of people can't hold it that long for sure. When I leaned over and got it angled down, I picked a spot like we talked about. A lot of people, you know, in that moment, they sort of just black out, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, you know, I picked a spot where I wanted that arrow to go in and took my time. It felt like a good shot. I had to time it, though, because he's moving moving yeah. moving so i got the pin kind of right in the general area where i want it i just need him to sit just give me the right body position as soon as he gave it to me i just let it go and uh you said it was 37 degrees 38 degrees i think that's what the range finder said yeah 38 degrees or 37 but it was yeah that's for sure it was steep yeah really steep super steep i'm looking down i mean the bow is angled mm-hmm. Um, one thing I, I, and I've practiced, I've done a lot of these shots where I'm shooting really steep angles, you know, and one of those things that that's important is that you're bending at the hip, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not contorting your shoulders to get into position. And, uh, anyway, trying to bend at the hip when you're on your knees, uh, that's tough. (laughs) It's sort of weird. Uh, I did the best I could angling down and, um, and getting in that position, but I felt the cam hitting my body um, because it was just so steep. So I'm trying to maneuver my leg out of the way and, and do it all. Anyway, um, actual yardage, I think Aaron said it shaved like eight or nine. Yeah, I think you said it was 22 or something. Or Yeah, so Aaron was like, the actual range is like probably 30 yards, mm-hmm. you know, shooting it for 22 and he's he's a uh that arrow when it entered it entered um right right where i was aiming maybe a little bit uh more forward but um right through the, the with the angle i had it looked like so the arrow goes in and i'm and i knew instantly yeah. fatal shot the the deer is dead and in fact, the arrow goes in and you can hear it. Like people even mentioned on Instagram, which yeah. is funny because I posted it. And I'm like, I'm going to cut it off right at the shot. And then people won't be able to hear or won't really know if I shot it or not. It'll just kind of be a teaser. Well, everybody could hear the thwack, the tough, telltale tough sound. And uh, so um, anyway, I shoot that that buck and uh, and I'm like, and, and he just, he, he takes the arrow and he just runs. But the arrow didn't pass through, which really shocked me. I'm like, really? It didn't go through? And uh, he's running down the hill. And I 
you film the little guy actually sprint away. Yeah, because I didn't know which way it went. You just leaned over after I shot, and the only movement you saw was because of the corner. He ran the other way around the corner. You can't see anything. So you film that little guy, and you're like, well, that ain't him. And then uh, I'm, and then I think I told you he's dead. He's dead. Yeah, you, we got that part on film. You look at it. Right I think so. Camera, you're like, he's dead. And then uh, we're like, well, let's you know run around that corner. I wanted to see where he was going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I figured uh, he had no idea we were up there. Wind was still solid. I felt like you know, he wouldn't be able to spot us. It's such a steep angle that, that this was a, I don't like to pressure an animal that's been hit, but I really felt like this situation was probably more good than harm, you know, to, to, to pressure him a little bit. And then if I could get another arrow in him, I want to. So I hustled around the corner and I really expected to find him dead, just laying there. And this is all on video. And we get real close, and you spot him, actually, before I did. I was looking still down right below, and you're like, he's right over there. And he was ahead of us a little ways, and you're like, get him again, get him again. So I'm like, okay. So I'm walking over there, and you're like, you're kind of like, faster, you know? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to spook him. You're like, faster. Anyway, we kind of hustle over to this nice little lip that blocked our view. Once we got down there, we were kind of just making a bunch of noise, but... He's standing there, and he is just covered in blood. He was super sick, yeah. And the the entry hole looked really good. The arrow was gone. It's like, hmm, that's weird. Uh, so it fell out somewhere as he was running up the hill, but the hole was massive, and there was blood all over his body. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's only been 40 seconds? 40. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good act. Pretty close. So uh, maybe, and so, but I'm surprised he's not on the ground. His mouth is open. I'm like, he's not even laying down. And we didn't spook him or anything. Like, this is just him getting hit and running. Normally, I, I see an animal get hit like this. They'll run around a corner, and they're like, oh, I don't feel good. And they'll lay down. Yeah. Not this dude. Yeah, he ran around the corner, and he is taking it like a man. Yeah. He is standing there. He's looking up the canyon. He's just like, oh, gosh. He's just hanging on. And I'm like, he doesn't even bed. And he kind of moves around a little bit and you're like 35 yards and uh i shoot him and it's not the greatest shot and then he's he runs and i shoot him again 35 yards and i i shoot him at 35 yards and i just waylay him yeah he was done so another fatal shot so it's two fatal shots and still that sucker runs down and stops. And I don't if 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 he's still standing, especially with an arrow. Yeah, when he's in range, I, I think I it's think not like a gun. Like I, I really want to make sure I take care of the meat, so I don't want to be blasting shoulders and you know. Um when you shoot him with a bow, uh, there's there's often a lot less trauma that will happen too but i i just want to make sure they go down and go down quick yeah so i i sneak over there again and take another i don't know shot and this time blows through his heart and and then he runs down and goes down but i was really surprised that he did not go down uh, after those first two arrows i really thought he would be done for yeah um faster uh, and so the re- and one of the reasons I'm talking about this is that these are big deer, way bigger than we have I've seen. Aaron and I were talking about it later and he's killed a lot of mule deer and he's like the bodies on these up here in Canada are they're like little elk. They're like little cow elk. Mm-hmm. Um just hugely muscled big big bodies. So this bull so this buck doesn't go down easy finally does and uh we experienced the same thing with aaron's buck and i was really wary about that because um after seeing my buck eat those arrows i really didn't know i really didn't think he was gonna um when aaron shot his buck and it ran ran off i was like yeah i'd like to give him hours four or five hours just because just because now I've seen how well they take a hit and I shot it with a compound and put up, you know, two inch hole in it. And 
um, Aaron ended up pushing his a little bit and, you know, trying to get in close again. And, and that buck, he wasn't dead and he wasn't right. going to be dead for a while. And so it could have been bad, you know, it could have been a hard time finding him, uh, because once he got pushed that, once he got pushed, he got that first hit, he ran and he laid down and he, and he would have just died there. Right. But we got a little closer, Aaron got a little closer and he, he beat feet out of there and then he went a long way. And if it weren't for some lucky glassing from the top by Lander, um, you know, he may have gotten away. So that was always such a hard call to know whether to push or I'm all about, and Lander said the same thing. I'm all about waiting. Yeah. Why? Well, you can always wait. Yeah. No, they that's will right. 99, I mean, not 99, but, but most of the time mm-hmm. you, you hit an animal, they're going to run to the first place they think is safe and lay down. Yeah. And if you've hit them in the guts or the, the lungs or the vitals of any kind, um, you know, if you hit a muscle, it's, it may or may not die. Right. You hit it where you know it's fatal. Just, it's just going to take time. Just give it time. And then when you go, when you look for it, you know right where it is, mostly. You're within right. a general direction. You push it. Aaron's buck went up the hill. Way up the hill. Stopped bleeding because he shot it pretty high. And that thing turned around and circled back behind us and went back to where he was shot almost. Well, we were going to totally look in the wrong direction. Right. Um, so... And that, again, I can't help but think that's not coincidence. Those suckers are smart. They're tough. They're, yeah, smart. they're smart. Yeah, that thing outwitted us big time. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, that was an awesome experience for me. Like, I, I'm kind of like addicted now. Good to we mule deer. We can't wait like, to have you guys back because going up there on that hill and crawling in after these deer yeah. is just, uh, and then the size of them. Uh, like South Cox has talked about mule deer hunting for years and mm-hmm. we've had South on the podcast and he's a good friend. And he talked about basically, you know, hunting mule deer. It's primarily what he does. Like no other species. Yeah. Is his, and, and he loves like, he talks about, you know, the challenge of, you know, finding them and then math like kind of strategically thinking of an approach and how to sneak up on them and then once you you know what's going to work with the wind and the terrain and he looks for micro topography and uh, terrain features that allow him to like stuff that you didn't think was there but you get there and you're like oh there's a little cut here and if i go up that cut that blocks this view and there's just you're just working with the the landscape to get in close and Mm -hmm. you're methodically getting there until you get that shot and uh and he's gotten very close to shots with some deer um, and just, and so I've always admired it and also wanted to do it and then to be here and to do it a number of times and, uh, and just to get the hang of it a little bit. Yeah. It's well, like now I have some newfound skills and drive and, and desire. And, and it's like, I want to redo it now yeah. with these new, this That's is right. new, new tool set. Well, have, you guys will have to come back and we'll do it again. So anyway, yeah, I just, uh, I can't say enough about the whole, the whole thing. It's, it's a, just, it's so fun chasing these big deer. Yeah. Well, I think it was just a special week this week too. We had a lot of fun just with the group. It was like, uh, for, I know like Jeff obviously knows all you guys from, bear hunting and mm-hmm. and stuff but uh yeah it was a pleasure with meeting you and aaron and and uh we talked about this quite a bit in the truck right like it was funny when uh picked uh you and kenton and scott up at the airport mm-hmm. um obviously when i didn't know those guys yeah and you know super fantastic people but uh yeah it was interesting with the podcast it was almost like uh, I already knew you and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and I met, had met Aaron a couple hours before that with Jeff, uh, at lunch and, yep. and same sort of thing. Uh, I know it's not the same when you guys meet 
people that are just right. are listening to the podcast. But it, yeah, it was such a fun week. Like it was, it really, truly was like being at hunt camp with with your buddies and uh there is a ton of banter and uh jokes and <laughs> and some serious stuff and uh it's uh it, it, serious in the sense of of like stalking and and those Dude, things but it was aaron fun. and i are not messing fun. around we want we want stuff no, to hit the ground and, we, we, and, <laughs> and that's why we're here too but yeah. uh no it, was, it truly was a pretty fun pretty fun week it's interesting like we it's fun to introduce someone to the podcast for the first time you know and have them check it out and and uh see him get excited about it and but there's also people that are that have been listening for a long time and when we meet someone like that it really does it's cool on our end too because even though we don't know the person right we know that they pretty much know us mm -hmm. you know they know just our personalities and what we're like and yeah. what matters to us. And so right off the bat, there's usually a warm connection that's there right off the bat, just yeah. because uh, even though we don't really know them, they know us. And so it just, there's a smoothness of conversation. Mm -hmm. And when we started talking, it was very easy to talk to you right off the bat. Yeah, I know. We had a lot of, um, Oh, lots of, lots of common things too, right? So yeah, yeah it was good. Cause everybody who does CrossFit's awesome pretty much I yeah <laughs> there is a cool community about it and jeff told me one time he's like i think if i uh, i don't know if i'm supposed to repeat this but oh, i think so uh he's like i think if i died i'd have more people from my crossfit gym show up at my funeral than my church that's right yeah so uh it certainly is a family you know sort of i don't know like it's a, it's a hardcore it's a cool community to be, to be a to be part yeah. of and every gym's a little different every crossfit box but mm -hmm. i really do have a lot of fun with with uh every gym i've been at yeah you yeah know. no it was a fun week and yeah wish it wasn't over i know yeah we got um a long flight home and see the kids and the family again it'll be nice uh uh, but I'll have some fond memories from this one. Me too. I was thinking about this, you know, which one of these hunts, you know, this bear, BC bear hunt versus this mule deer hunt, right. like which one was, uh, what, what, what did I like about these hunts? You know, both of them are hosted by primitive outfitting, Jeff Lander. And, uh, the bear hunt is a lot less expensive than mm -hmm. this mule deer hunt, like half. And, um, and you're talking about shooting giant black bears and bears that have really, really rich coats. Like they're not rubbed out, right. um, but big old, beautiful bears during the rut. So breeding season for the bears and they're on a different level yeah. in a way I've never seen bears and hunted bears before. Which was a blast. Yeah. Um, lots of, lots of, I mean, the, I, I would say the difference between the two types of hunts mostly was the bear hunt is chill, relaxed. You sleep in till like 10 o'clock, you know, you roll out and maybe do a morning afternoon hunt because bears are lazy. And then you come back, hang out for a while. And you go out for a couple more hours in the evening. And pretty much every morning and every evening, there is an opportunity to stock something. And so it was quite the, um, like, just hanging out, chill. It was not a hard hunt at all. Right. Super relaxed with sprinkled excitement every morning, every evening. And uh, sneaking in close to, to some bears. It was a neat experience. This mule deer thing, though. It was way harder. <laughs> You're talking yeah. like cactuses and, you know, belly crawling and uh, getting home late at night because you're hunting till last light and then getting up at the butt crack of dawn, you know, 5 a.m. and getting out on the, on the, as the sun's coming up. And it seems like there was no afternoons that we took off. You're We're hunting pretty from much morning dark to dark till dark and uh and then 
it wasn't a ton of hiking, but it was a ton of glassing. Yeah. A lot of glassing. And then there, there was some hiking when it needed to happen, but lots of belly crawling, dude. Lots of cactus. Lots of bear crawls. Lots of pain. Lots of pain. (laughs) Uh, So, but I'll say this, that when it comes down to it, um, I love hunting bears. I really love hunting bears. But this whole mule deer thing's on another level. It's pretty cool. It, it is pretty cool. It's a I, I keep I I go back to like let me ask you, like is it just that it's mule deer hunting? I mean, is that part or or is it just also that there's just giant mule deer? Well, I think it's a combination. For me, hunting here and guiding here is super exciting because um, we do generally get action mm-hmm. every, every, most days, you know, get a stock or two for each guy. But the opportunity, and not that they're all world-class animals, but the opportunity to see those deer and, and to try your skills against that animal that's, you know, five, six, whatever years old, that's, you know, so, some of these deer get hunted really hard. So to put, you know, your skills against, against that animal is, is pretty, it's pretty special. And, uh, um, like we were talking about, I think that, you know, any stock on any of these deer that you get into, you know, 30, 40, 20, sometimes less yards. And these guys with their, with their recurves and, and longbows and stuff that get into even closer. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a test. I think it tests your skills and, and you got to have a little bit of luck here and there too. Mm-hmm. But, um, so I, I think it's a combination. Mule deer are pretty cool animals to, to grow that big and then basically with not a tree in sight. Um, so they're cool, but, but the, the wariness of them and, and testing your skills against that animal is pretty fun. I was going to say, you know, I, I, if the average buck had been 150 yeah. and smaller, because we talk about this, like it's not about the size of the animal, it's about the experience. Mm-hmm. But how much does the size of the animal contribute to the experience? Well, and, you know what I mean? Like we, we debate this all the time, yeah, Aaron talk, and I, yeah. you know, and, and, and we, it took a, up a large part of our week. Talking, yeah. Right? And, and I, I think, you know, you know, you tell me what you think, but I feel like, um, there's, I would be lying if I said, you know, my jaw wasn't hitting the floor when I saw those fir- those two bucks the first yeah. day and was like, I get a chance to hunt those. Mm-hmm. That's pretty neat. Where I'm seeing a 150 buck and I'm going, well, that's cool. Yeah. But I'm like now hyper into this other deer. And I'll be, I'm just being... Mm-hmm. I do not get generally, I'm not like, I want to shoot that. Cause then everybody would see how big my deer is. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I'm really not, I don't know. I never really have been motivated that way. I just want the experience, but I also like, I've always wanted to shoot a giant black tail buck. Yeah. And I've shot some good ones, but I'm not like these big hogs, like huge bucks, like, Chris Pasqua shoots, uh, or has shot. I, I want to shoot, you know, a, gr- a big buck and cause it's like a unicorn. Uh, it's, uh, it's such a rare thing to see. Well here, it felt like there were unicorns everywhere. And that was yeah. a pretty cool experience to be able to see these big bucks. And it definitely, you know, I'd be lying if I said it didn't get me, make the hunt more exciting. Yeah. This raised the stakes a little bit more, made it a little more intense. Like it's a buck of a lifetime kind of thing. It is. They are. Yeah. I mean, I like, I, I can't, I can't lie to you either. I mean, I, I really <laughs> like those big ones and I don't know what, what that is that makes you <laughs> is it chase just genetic them. or is it, oh, I, is I, it personally, I think what I think it is, is I, I mean, you would like to think that those bigger, um, animals, more mature animals, better genetics are like the, the ultimate chase. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They, they have, they have the most amount of skills compared to, 
uh, a fork and horn that, you know, is this is his first winter. Absolutely. Right? But we talked so, about this. If you have a 150 buck, you know, and a 180 buck, they could be identical in every way absolutely. except the size of the antler. Yep. Yeah. And when you compare the two, in fact, one of the 150 might be wiser, smarter, and more difficult mm-hmm. to, to kill. You know, yeah. antler size doesn't necessarily indicate once a buck gets too mature, it's just going to maximize its genetic potential. Right. And that's what it is. That buck I shot, he's a hog. His yeah, body's he's a big huge. Yeah. Aaron's buck, I think, had a bigger body, but not by much. Mm-hmm. Not not by much. And I'm like, uh, if those two tangled, you know, you wonder the the bigger guy should win. You know, yeah, he, that's not always the case, though. But it's not. Yeah, and uh, it's very interesting. I, mm-hmm. I just you know I just bring it. Yeah, up I don't know. I I mean, they look pretty cool with big horns. I just I'm just telling you, like, yeah. I don't think it's culturally, uh, and I could be wrong, that drives my interest in like Aaron's interest and other interests in, in size of horns. Mm-hmm. I just wonder if it's just something that is just like, why do we think horns are so cool? I don't know. Because. But they are cool. They are cool. Super cool. <laughs> They're just cool. And when you yeah. see that much just mass and bone and, and the formations, you know, and it's like you never know quite what you're going to get. Aaron's, we could see, I could see in the spotter all the stickers hanging off of this buck. Yeah. And, and uh, when he shot this buck, I was like, oh, he shot the smaller one. <laughs> and I was kind of splitting hairs because they were both giant, right? Yeah. Uh, and, but I, I had been watching that, the bigger one for, and, and I say bigger, I can't tell for sure. Uh, in fact, Aaron's could be the bigger one. I, in fact, Lander said, I, he's like, ah, when that, when Aaron shot and he saw the other one run off, he's like, man, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe he did shoot as the smaller one, but you're talking inches. Yeah. Right. And at that point it's like, why are we even having the conversation? Yeah. And, and and I think when it it's comes to it's because it's fun. It's fun to have the conversation. And we got to talk about something, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, but yeah, they're all good experiences, and and uh, you know we have we do have people that come and and their their quest is to shoot a one eighty to two hundred plus inch mule deer, and and you know I I think that's great if yeah. that's what your thing is, but I mean. Um, if if you if you pass up you know four or five deer that are that are mature animals in the quest for that then then you should be happy to go home empty-handed if that's what happens you know yeah and that can happen here people i think sometimes people think oh i saw you know two or three 180 plus deer here today i should be able to get one of those in in six or seven days and and the fact is it's it it may not happen with your bow yeah so yeah that's one thing aaron was saying he's like especially with trad gear oh you got to have a dose of reality yeah well what those Um, guys do is pretty cool dude when he shot that buck i mean that's 38 yards is a poke with a recurve dude and steep angle pressure Mm -hmm. that's pretty He's the ice man. Yeah. No, or something. Pretty cool. pretty cool. The Terminator. <laughs> well, dude, I want to thank you. I, I had a blast and, and part of that, you know, the reason that this experience is so good is because um we have guys like that we get to hang out with like you and Lander, which uh you're just like salt of the earth, our kind of guys, you know. You can take a joke. You can take, you know, the teasing, you can dish it out, you can give it back and, and, uh, and then just laugh and all that stuff is you're calm. You're, you're, I'm shushing you because you're making, you're breaking, (laughs) making noise behind me and I'm making more noise going down the hill. And it's like, you're, uh, you were a good, very good guide. Uh, so let me kind of do my thing and. Uh, it's just like it was a it was a really good experience and so look forward to uh staying in touch yeah and yeah, well, and uh you shot a giant 
nice buck this year. Yeah, I was lucky. Yeah, one eighty ish, one eighty ish, something. Beautiful buck, and people can look at the photos of that on. You have them on Instagram. I don't know if it is on my Instagram. Oh, dude, page, but uh, maybe I'll have to put it on there. You need to put it on Instagram. Yeah, Ben, Ben, I'll put it on Instagram. Okay, uh, right. but uh, and you're what is it, Jackson? Uh, B Jack, I think two one two, or Jack B two one two. That's how much I use it. Is it Jack? Okay, Jack B two one two. Yeah, and he's gonna start using Instagram more, so I can mm-hmm. follow Jack's life and stalk him go. and see what's going on. That'd be excellent. I think there's like six pictures on there. Or yeah, they're you, pretty old. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So yeah. I'll throw wrap some it up. crud on there, dude. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the. Yeah, the man. Week. We had a we had a lot. We of got fun a bunch of videos on YouTube of this hunt, mm-hmm. and we're trying to edit them and get them up uh, so people can see that yeah. see that. Uh, but we haven't. We've not uh, really a lot of hours. <laughs> no, we haven't. Not not the hours I expected to have yeah. actually. So, uh, but we'll get those videos out. We have great footage of my hunt and Aaron's hunt, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll uh, throw those those up on internet um, asap by the middle of next week. At the I latest, know. I think. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Stay gritty. Yeah, you too. Okay, gritty friends. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes, Podbean, or Stitcher. We love reading your reviews. And connect with us on social media if you're on there. Look us up on Facebook and Instagram. And take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can receive notifications when we upload new videos. We've got a sweet deal with Mountain Ops. You get 20% off on all Mountain Ops supplements, combo packs, and apparel when you type in the word gritty at checkout. If you're a hardcore elk hunter or you want to be, go to the Elk 101 website online and check them out. Our friend Corey Jacobson is killing it with some of the best elk hunting information and entertainment on the web. All right, friends, let me leave you with one other quote from Theodore Roosevelt who said, It behooves every man to remember that the work of the critic is of altogether secondary importance and that, in the end, progress is accomplished by the man who does things. We all have a choice. We can be people who do things or people who criticize the work of others. It's pretty simple, really. Get out there and do your thing. Good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>